Back, uh, back in the mid-1950s, there was a television quiz show. They didn't really have a lot of quiz shows back then. And one came up, and actually, overnight, it became so popular, it actually passed I Love Lucy in the ratings. It was called the $64,000 question. Some of y'all are old enough to remember that. It was the precursor to, I want to be a billionaire, or so you want to be whatever. You start with a question, and if you answer the question right, the amount of money would double, and then you answer the next one, and then the money would double, all the way up to a grand prize of $64,000. Now, keep, that doesn't sound like much based on you want to be a millionaire. Remember, back then, uh, the average man's uh, uh, annual income was only about $3,500, $3,600. So you can imagine what $64,000 meant. Now, as popular as it was, it was only on the air for four years. Only there for four years. It got canceled because some other quiz shows like it all popped up, you know, based on the popularity. And there was a federal investigation. And what they found was they got evidence that they were being rigged. And they found out that the sponsors and producers, when they interviewed contestants, they would find the ones that they liked, maybe somebody who was really pretty, or somebody who had a great story, and they would get, make sure that they got the easy questions, and the guy that they didn't like, he would get the hard questions. And then it was also proved that some of them were even given a list, not only of the answers, but how to answer them. One example was someone had to name the seven dwarfs. And he, he had the piece of paper, how he was going to answer it. You know, this one, this one, this one, pause, wipe your forehead, look down. Oh, I know. How about scripting? And so when it came out that these things happened, immediately the public was in an outrage and it got canceled. Everything got shut down. Now the reason I wanted to point that out is to win in that quiz show would have been pretty difficult. But we have to all agree that if you already know the answer to the question, it's pretty darn easy to get it right. The Gospel of John was written to provide the answer to the supreme question. Not the $64,000 one, but the most important, the most critical question known to man. Here it is. Who is Jesus? That's the question. Who is Jesus? Because it is the question that every single person who lives or has lived or will live will someday have to answer. Who is Jesus? You know, some would say he was a very religious man, very, very honorable, highly respected, great teacher. The Mormons say that he is a, he's a God, but he's a created little dog lesser God, kind of a diddy God. Jehovah Witness said, he, well, he used to be Michael the Archangel. Got a promotion. Christian Scientologists say, well, he's just a human, but he led an ideal type of life. Islam says he's one of the 124,000 prophets that God has sent down over the many, many centuries. But he was really a great prophet, not as great as Muhammad, but he ranks right up there with Moses and Muhammad. He's a prophet. And the Jews say he was, well, Jesus is an extremely false Messiah. They really don't <coughs> consider him at all. And so although, as I just read, there, there's, there's a lot of different various responses and answers to the question, but ultimately it boils down to only two categories. One, Jesus is God. Or B, I was waiting to see if y'all were paying attention. Or two, he's not. He either is or he is not. God. J. 
John wrote the gospel for the purpose of answering the question so that we all might know and understand. And anyone who reads the gospel might have the answer when the question comes up. Matter of fact, at the end of this gospel, right towards the end in uh, chapter 20, verse uh, 31, he writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this book was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. It's the reason why he wrote it. That's why the book of John is a little different than the other gospel accounts. You know, the first three, they're called the synoptic gospels, because they're very similar. They were all written within maybe five or six years of each other. Uh, they had a lot of the same information in them. Each one has a lot of stuff. Some of the same parables, some of the same events. Uh, or they didn't mean they copied off of each other's paper, but it just means it has a lot of the same stuff because they're basically concentrating on that three-year period of Jesus' life from his birth, and some of them talk about his birth and a couple of the different ones and his lineage, and some of them talk about the lineage. Uh, they have a lot of same information. Matter of fact, it's been said that about 90% of what you can find in the book of Mark is also found in Matthew and Luke. So they're very similar in the content. There are some differences even in the stories, but a lot of the same stories and parables are there. But see, John was written decades later, much later, after the first three Gospels. And unlike the other Gospels, when you read through, you're not going to find any account of his birth. You're not going to find any account of it of talking about his baptism, which is in all three of the others. Uh, there's no mention of the institution of the Lord's Supper, how that was included exactly in the way that it's in the other Gospels. You know, there's no transfiguration episode. There's no temptation in the desert. There's no scene from Gethsemane that we had when he went to pray. One of the most striking things is when you read through, the first thing you notice is there's no parables. None of those parables you find in all the others, none of them are there. So it points out that this is a very different gospel. And while the other three gospels concentrate on basically from his birth to his death, the entire life of our Lord, the gospel of John, two-thirds of it deals with the last week of his life. To remember why it is written. It's to answer that question. Who is Jesus? And actually it's a, it's a question Jesus himself asked. In Matthew chapter 16 in verses 13 and 14, uh, the, he was there with his disciples and he asked them, who do people say I am? And they had a bunch of answers. Oh, some of them say you're Elijah. Some of them say this prophet. Some of them say that John the Baptist come back. That's what they, he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but my question is, who do you say I am? Because that's important. Not what they say, but you say. Who do you say I am? And they were having one of the great confessions of faith. Who do you say I am? See, you've got to answer that question. As we open up our, the Gospel of John, the first two verses give us the answer. Then John's going to spend the rest of the book proving the answer, and then we're going to get to chapter 20, and then he says it over again. If you ever had to write a paper in school, you're supposed to give your thesis at the beginning, the paper is the text and the proof, and then at the end, you're supposed to restate the thesis to set how you proved what you said at the beginning. John's written exactly like that. Here's the thesis. Look in chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now some of you kind of have a question about the Word. We've all seen how they use that, that, that phrase, the Word. In the Greek it's called the Logos. The Logos. In the beginning was the Word. 
Why didn't he just say, was Jesus? Wouldn't that make it a lot easier? Well, if he's trying to explain to us who Jesus is and why he is God, he wants to take us beyond that limited spectrum. We have to begin thinking about Jesus as something different and more than just a person. Remember, Jesus is the human name that God gave for the person who was going to be born of Mary. So he, here he's using the term, the, the word, the logos. Now in the Greek mind, that, because in the Greek that's what the logos is, it was a sense of, of reason and logic and wisdom. It was a sense of what makes order in all the universe. It's what kind of makes everything understandable. It puts emphasis and understanding on everything and knits it and meshes it all together. That's what logos is. One translation, instead of saying the word, one translation says, in the beginning was the living expression. The living expression. The expression of what? The living expression of God. If you want to know what God is and who God is and what God is about, look, there's Jesus. He is the living expression of all things. And to the Jews, when they should hear about the Word, and they read this, and it says in the beginning was the Word, immediately they go back to the Old Testament, and everything was founded based on the, the Word of God. Thus says the Word of God. God says this. So says God. The Word, the Word, the Word of God. It meant God's all authority and power over all things. If God said it, it is true. And so when we see the expression, the Word, both to the Gentiles and to the Jews, it had the expression of something much greater than mankind. All wisdom, all power, all understanding, all authority. That's Jesus. And so Jesus here is described as the word, and Paul, or John, excuse me, it was too long doing Paul. John makes three very bold statements in these opening verses. First, he says, in the beginning was the Word. Was. When all creation came into being, at the very start of the very start, Jesus was already there. He was already there. That means He was, is pre-existent. And if that phrase sounds familiar in the beginning, it's because when God revealed Himself to humanity, in the beginning of Genesis, remember that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, God didn't have to stop and explain how He was there or why He was there. It's just He was. That's why when He described Himself, and Moses wanted, well, who should I tell you? He says, I am. I am. I've always been and always will be. I am. So the very same description that, Jesus, that they're using here for Jesus is the description that God uses for himself. He's pre-existent. So if you want to talk about who Jesus is, you've got to go back. Back from it. Look for it. And get to the very beginning of creation. And keep going back. And keep going back. You see, there was a never time, never was a time when Jesus was not. Philippians 2 6 tells us that before Jesus came to be a man and appear on this earth, he was in very nature God. He was God. He's pre-existent. He always was. And he always will be. Second thing that we learn from this passage is that in the beginning he was with God. Now that's a bold statement because of that we can see the unity of God. It gives us a picture immediately when we start thinking about the Trinity. How one God in three persons. Because if he was with God, that means it had to be two different personalities. But one unity. One God. 
in three persons. The same, but different. That's why Jesus said in John uh, 14, 9, He said, if anyone has seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen us both. We came, we were both hanging out together. You thought you just saw the one, but you saw us both. So Jesus, the Word, has always existed, just like God the Father, but He has also always been with God the Father in that personal, eternal relationship. Third thing He says was the Word was God. The Word was God. Understand that God is the subject of that phrase. So most literally, it could be translated and said, and God was the Word. God was the Word. Now our Jehovah Witnesses have, because in the original text, they don't have a definite article for the, they've taken it upon themselves to add their own article. And if they're in their trash, you'll find it's the only time in that construction, in the whole New Testament, in all of that Greek, they translated it a different way. It's because they don't want Jesus to be the God. They translate it as He was a God. Clearly we know from all the rest of the Scripture, clearly we know from just what the Greek says that that is not true. When it says that Jesus was God, in the beginning He already he was God. It means that everything that's true about God, everything that's true about His power and His wisdom and His glory and His love and His holiness and His righteousness and His mercy and truth, everything that's true about God the Father is also true about God the Son. And it can only all be true if Jesus is God. God. He is God. It's just how God presented Himself to us in a package that we could open. He's the only way that we can truly know God. You might be able to see God's power. You might be able to see His creativity. You might be able to see those things in nature. But that doesn't really tell us who God is. You want to know what God's like? Study the Gospels. Study the Gospels. It'll tell you what God is like. Because as Jesus says, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. If you know God, you know me. I am God. See, both the Father and the Son, they both of them hated sin. Read the Gospels. But they love the sinners. Both of them command for uh, justice. But both the Father and the Son administer mercy. Both are holy and mighty. But they care for the weak and the humble. Read the stories. And because God is perfect, and Jesus then would also be perfect, then his sacrifice on the cross had to be perfect. That's why it is the one and only sacrifice that's acceptable. And there doesn't need to be more and more and more. Because if an offering is going to be made to a perfect and holy God, and if it's a perfect and holy sacrifice, that takes care of it. So who do you say he is? Who is Jesus? If you just see him as being a really good person, someone you want to emulate and be like, someone that was did the right stuff at the right time, just a really, really, really good man, well, that's somebody you can afford to reject. 
Because after all, it's just a name. If you see him as kind of a milder version of the God of glory, and some people mistakenly they say God was the Old Testament, wrath and anger, but then the New Testament is Jesus, kind of a softer, milder, new version of God. If that's how you view Jesus, A, you've never read the book of Revelation. But if that's how you see him, then you can afford to manipulate him for give you comfort whenever you need it. Because you only see him as a God that's not too judgmental, not too harsh. But if you see him as a sense of comfort, especially when times get tough and things get hard, that's when you'll call on his name. You can ignore him all the rest of the time until you need to make the phone call. Most of the world sees him who even acknowledge him as one of those three. And sadly in our churches, many see him as one of those three. But if you see Jesus for who he truly is, if you see Jesus and know in your heart that he is God, that he has, and if he's God, he has absolute control over your eternity. If he is God, he is the one who controls the next beat of your heart. He is the one who is going to give you your next breath of life. He's the one. If he is God, he is our one and only hope. For we have no other hope. He's our one and only peace because we can find peace nowhere else. And if He is our God, He is our only provision for any real joy. And if Jesus is God, we can never reject or ignore His words. Picking and choosing which ones will obey. Because the truth is, if Jesus is God to you, if Jesus is God to me, then our only acceptable response is to kneel before Him, asking for His forgiveness, and serve Him with all of our hearts. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, we lift up our prayer this morning asking you to continue to work in creating us a new heart. One that all through the day helps us to remember who exactly you are. And Lord, by doing so, it will add a, a different view of the scriptures that we read and the stories that we hear. And how we feel when someone blasphemes your name. And how we feel when we understand the sacrifice that you made. You see, the more we understand and appreciate, comprehend the fact that you are God, the very God, the creator of all things, Lord, that will help our worship and service Yes, in the coming week, Lord, that you continue to draw that into our mind and our attention, that we might draw closer to you in our relationship with you, our God and Lord and Savior.